I don't have a computer. And the, uh, the last, uh, I managed to work the uh, manual typewriter, the, o the old Underwood, but I never got further than that. And the, uh, so I, I'm not on Facebook. I don't have an iPad. I, fortunately, I have an office with, the, uh, with young editors. And so if I have to look up something in the internet, I can use it in that way. I can ask them to print something out for me or get me five paragraphs on the 18th century or whatever I'm asking for. And my uh, concern, I'm, I don't doubt that the, uh, the digital world is um, truly a wonder to behold and, and that uh, it's full of possibility and, and the, there are a lot of upsides, but as Kevin Slavin remarked this morning, there are also some downsides, and so I'm more concerned about the downsides than I am about the the upsides. And and that's because I grew up with words and grew up with books and grew up with writing. I actually like, I enjoy the sensual pleasure of, of, of writing with a pen. I enjoy the, the, the aesthetic of of reading a book. I mean, it's a pleasure to me. And I can't get that feeling from a machine. I don't think machines are sexy. I don't think they have a sense of humor. And to me, the, the uh, fundamental uh, saving grace of, of the human being is uh, laughter, to recognize himself or herself as mortal. And the machine thinks it's immortal, or knows itself to be immortal. So it's it's at about the same level as as the uh, the ape before it turned into a man. And the it, it doesn't have language. I mean, the, the uh, or at least a language that 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 I know how to how to use the. Um, I have a wonderful quote from Charles V, who once said, he speaks French to his, his mistress, Italian to his cook, uh, English to his priest, or Latin to his priest, and German to his horse. But the, the, then the question is, what language do you speak to a machine in? And what language does it speak back to you? I mean, we now have a system where we are dependent on machines to tell us uh, how and why we are human beings. I mean, it sets up Match.com, it sets up the trades for Goldman Sachs, it's the ATM machine, it's the EKG, and we're constantly uh, giving over our own uh, thinking, our own uh, creativity, our own imagination to some sort of, of program. And, and when you write, as, as Kevin Slavin said this morning, when you write for uh, the computer, you, you're not writing for a human being, you're writing for an algorithm. And, and as to what it may recognize the Steve Jobs or insurance or Syria as a object and promoted in the Google rank accordingly, but it does not necessarily know what those words mean. It, in other words, the, the, the content is of no value. The, uh, what's of value is uh, the crowd that can be attached to it. I mean, it's the the bringing in of, of people, you know, hits. And that to me is, is, is a, uh, a problem. Max Frisch, the Swiss playwright, says a long time ago that the trouble with technology is the knack of so arranging the world that we don't have to experience it. And 
more and more we live with, within a, a bubble a, of, of media of, of various kinds. I mean, artificial environments within a, essentially a virtual reality. And we lose touch, not, with, not only with the, the uh, world as a whole, but with, with ourselves. The, how do you find out, how do you tell yourself the story uh, that, that is your life? I mean, how do you discover a life of your own without a language in which to tell yourself that story? And the average American high school student in 1940 had a vocabulary of roughly 10,000 words, and now it is 5,000 words. He, he or she, however, does have an immense uh, vocabulary of rebuses or signs. I, I taught a course in writing in the late 1980s at Yale, and I had the, uh, it was a seminar, and it was limited to uh, 12 students, and I had something like 60 applications, and I, and they had to each of them write a paragraph as to why they wanted to take this class. <laughs> and the, uh, before reading the names, I, I just turned it over and read the paragraph and picked the 12 best paragraphs, at least in my mind, but that's a completely subjective judgment. But okay, I, I then turned them over and all 12 were girls. And the department chairman said, that doesn't work, you have to take six boys, six girls, no matter what, <clears throat> which I did. Out of the class uh, of 12, there were only about uh, three of them that could, could write. And these are juniors and seniors at Yale University. They're very, very bright people. But what they had in their heads was, were pattern recognitions. You, 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 they could remember to the exact uh, camera shot what they had seen in a sitcom or in a film, and, but they had no uh, knowledge of, they had no, uh, they didn't have much language. One of them had taken a course in her junior year in the 19th century a novel, and she had had to read one of Dickens's novel to do that. And she was able to break it down analyze it, six tiers of symbolism, seven lit layers of cultural data, and so on. And then I said to her, well, did you ever read another novel by Dickens? No. <clears throat> it, it was not a pleasure to her. It was something like a um, jigsaw puzzle or trying to put together a model of a triceratops. I mean, it was a problem to be solved. It wasn't a pleasure to be uh, enjoyed. And without that element of, of pleasure, um, I think it's very hard to, to teach reading. I mean, I am now, or I'm now the editor of a magazine called Lapham's Quarterly, which is dealing with, it brings to bear a great many texts from various points in the world and time to a question or an issue that's in the news. So we've done them, issues on money, we've done them on environment, we've done them on food, we've done them on sex, and so forth. <clears throat> and the, uh, the only criteria that I have is, is, the, uh, is this fun to read? Is, is this, literature is once defined by Cyril Conley as something that you read twice. And it works. I mean, it turns out that there's uh, the, the um, circulation has been going straight up over, we started with 4,000, we've now got almost 40 uh, 
and this is there's no advertising in it. It's it's got art and drawing, maps and marvelous texts. I mean, the writers are all of them A-list: Aristophanes, Gibbon, Shakespeare, Virginia Woolf, and so on. But, and the on the basis of that, we were asked to try to come up with a way of teaching reading uh, to sixth grade students online. So we are now making a, uh, an app, I guess, <laughs> that is trying to engage kids uh, with the computer. I mean, they have a tablet, and their, their teacher has a tablet. This company is, is here in, in Brooklyn. It's called Amplify Learning, and they have lots of, uh, you know, people like yourselves in, in Dumbo. And, the, and what we have done is we have made it a, a, a mixed media kind of thing. We have, first of all, the, what comes up on, the, on their screens is a library and their desk in the library. And they can touch a, a book, a, a title, which in the, in the, uh, in the, on the tablet, it's leather bound, and they can touch it, and that the text can come up for them. But it comes up as really a beautiful text as it would be uh, printed in the page of a book. It doesn't come up as, uh, it doesn't come up the way it would come up on a, if you're scrolling down in a computer. Because that's another thing that's, uh, an aesthetic pleasure is, is the, the way the print is set up and the, the typeface and the leading and so on. <clears throat> and the text, so we did one, they wanted us to do something on the gold rush. <clears throat> Sorry, so, okay, so they hit the book and what comes up are passages from Bret Hart, Mark Twain, uh, General William Sherman, who was a marvelous writer, by the way, and, and, what, but, and was in California in 1848-49, in the United States Army, in headquarters of the United States Army, it was then the capital, California, which was Monterey, and they sent him by horseback to drive up, I mean, to ride up to uh, Sutter's Mill, bring back a gold nugget to find out whether, in fact, it was gold. And he did that, and that nugget was sent around Cape Horn to Washington, where it was verified as gold, and that's what starts the uh, gold rush. <clears throat> Sherman writes beautifully, and, and his, I, I come from California, and he's riding a horse, horse from Monterey up, up, up the Sacramento River. And his description of the, the valley, uh, with now Silicon Valley, is marvelous. I mean, it is exactly, he has a sense of the landscape. He has the words with which to describe the um, feeling of the um, sky, the eucalyptus tree, the mountains in the, in the distance, and so on. Okay, so that comes up on, on the uh, screen, together with Hart and Twain. And then we also have um, maps and lists of what things cost. You get off a ship in San Francisco Bay in 1849, and you want to go to the gold rush, and what do you need? I mean, you have to get a mule, and you have to get a, an axe, and a pan, the pan for gold, and, and what do those things cost? And it gives you the price list, and then it gives you the route that you're likely to follow, and the obstacles that you're likely to meet on the way, which includes uh, outlaws of, of various descriptions, and uh, natural hazards, and the, then it also has music. So we have music of the, of the period. So, oh, so somebody's playing 
Oh Susanna on a banjo, which is what would have been played in uh, campfires and poker flat. And then we have film, and we take film of, of two kinds. The, needless to say, we also have photograph and painting. But the uh, film, that we can take some film from uh, old documentary. And then we can take some film from Hollywood epic or Hollywood Western, not for the dialogue, but for the for the uh, for the photography. For the some of the cinematography is is, is as you know uh, extremely beautiful, and we can use some of that, and we put that all together. But the whole basis of it is to incur in 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 the student. Uh, a sense of pleasure, because a mind is not a vessel to be filled. It, it, it's a fire to be kindled. You, you want to awaken the student to the force power uh, of his or her own, of his or her own mind, and that requires you know that's in other words to his or her own humanity, and a, a teacher can do that. I mean, a, a teacher that, I, I certainly was lucky enough to have a teacher like that in grammar school, and, and most people that I talk to can remember the teacher in grammar school or high school or, or, or college. But that's a, that's a human exchange. That's a, uh, uh, and, and, it, and it goes to the use of of language and the studies. We also have a grant now from um, the Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to see if we can take this experiment, this thing we're doing for Amplify Learning and, and do it, to do more of it or maybe do it for seventh, eighth, ninth grade students. But again, the, the, the basis of it is to uh, the objective is is not to provide a lot of uh, data. Data is about pinning things down and wrapping them up and putting putting them in some sort of uh, commercial category. And the, the object here is to and it. it is to give them, to make them see that, that reading is a pleasure because the trouble with most of the textbooks that, that kids get, in no matter what state, I mean, I, I've looked at sixth grade textbooks in Florida, California, Texas, even, even Massachusetts, and they've been dumbed down to such a degree that there's no, that the kid would say to himself, well, if this is what I get to, if this is, if this is reading, why am I taking the trouble to learn how to read? I mean, it, it, it's because the, the language has been so, uh, uh, I don't, well, a lot of it is political, a lot of it is what they call political correctness, the number of the long lists of words that are impermissible in, in textbooks, you can't use words that suggest racial dysfunction or disharmony or poverty or class or <laughs> unhappiness or death. I mean, it's an, phenomenal what, what is eliminated. And that, of course, is somebody else uh, thinking for you. And, and that was one of my problems when I when I tried to learn shift from the uh, the technology of, of a manual typewriter to a, a uh, first to an electric typewriter and then to a computer. I, I just never I could never understand how the computer was thinking. I mean, why when I push this did it do that? When to me it seemed like it ought to do something else. I mean, I, I couldn't get I couldn't get with the program. 
and that's that's uh, my fault as as much as the uh, as the um, the technology itself. As I say, the technology I'm sure I know is, is uh, marvelous in many of its functions and aspects, but it's also, um, as far as I can see, it, it's, the studies show you that nobody ever reads a, a full page on a, on a computer screen. They read 18% of it. Again, they're looking at it the way animals look at their environment. It's, it's a very distracted uh, kind of concentration. It, it's distraction more than concentration. But that, um, but again, that's the way we, that's pattern recognition. We, we, we walk around in a, within a media reality over the course of the day. And, see advertisements, see flashing signs, see logos, and we can recognize those. We can, we, we can recognize the Ralph Lauren, and we can recognize the, it's kind of like a rebus. And the, uh, apparently that's the way people, at least according to the studies made by the Gates Foundation, uh, that's the way people tend, sorry, read, read a page in the computer. The, it, it allows people to uh, rely on their, uh, to, to atrophy, parts of their brain atrophy. I, I was down making a speech and listening to a speech in a brain institute in Dallas last year. And the brain apparently is a very uh, plastic, substance and it adapts itself to circumstance. And this of course is McLuhan's same point. We shape our tools and our tools shape us. And the same thing happens with the brain. Certain uh, attributes, certain of its powers atrophy. Others uh, Evolve. It, it's never. Uh, it's never a in, in perfect balance. It, it's always looking for a uh, a new shape, a new form to fit itself to circumstance. That's part of evolution. So the brain loses its capacity for language. It loses its capacity for imagination creativity. Einstein doesn't hit upon the notion of MCC square from a crowd source. I mean, he's, that is a leap of, of the imagination, which he then has to uh, work his way around to, finally, in 1920, with the transit of Venus to, to uh, show that it was a very good guess. <laughs> The, uh, and a lot of the major scientific uh, discoveries have followed from that. Uh, I mean, they, they build on each other as, you know, science is not a one person in, in a single cell because it's what the work has been done by the generations before. I mean, it's a wonderful, the history of science is a great study in, in that kind of ladder. I mean, it's Newton saying that you have to stand on the shoulders of giants. And the, on the other hand, the, the, the flash of uh, imagination, inspiration, genius, how, however you want to describe it, 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 it's something that comes it, it, it has this kind of grounding, but it, it, it is not crowdsourced. And I also have no, again, the, the internet as it's set up now to me is, um, is simply an advertising tool. It, 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 it's money talking to money, and I'm not really not interested in that conversation. I don't care what, 
other people think about a restaurant um, or a movie. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, unless I'm trying to sell them something, but I'm not trying to sell them something. I, I'm, I'm, as, as a writer, I'm, I'm trying to talk to them. I'm trying to uh, learn from them and learn from their, their human intelligence, learn from their experience. And one of the reasons that so, so many of the movies today are so bad, as, as Kevin pointed out, is because they're not made, they're made by a machine to talk to a machine. I mean, they're not, in other words, they're made by algorithms, by copying other movies or templates that have been crowdsourced or focus group marketed and so on. And then, so it's not based on their experience. It, it's not based on the, the, uh, the human uh, encounter, either with the world or with himself or herself. And so uh, th that to me is why so much of it is so uh, not worth watching. And, and uh, again, if you, you could trawl through um, the long tales that, that come with the computer comments, I mean, you know, with the blog posts, and find very few of them, at least I find very few of them, um, worth reading. Um, again, it, it's the computer, at least is, I mean, the, the internet tends to be, it, it's the, dis, the, di, the distinction between the price of the thing and the worth of a thing. And that is a, a difference that we have got to, to learn if, if we're going to, pardon the expression, save the planet. I mean, the environmental uh, news, as you all know, is, is not good on, on all fronts. Climate, water, resource, food, population, all those signs are uh, uh, pointing in, in a dismal direction. And a machine is not going to come up with a, an answer to that problem. You can't look to technology to uh, solve political problems. Robert Darnton, who is one of the writers who's written uh, voluminously about the book, the history of the book, the future of the book, print, and so on, says that the fundamental uh, quality or necessity, uh, requirement for citizenship and for um, democratic self-government is reading and writing. You think back to the founders of the Republic in the late 18th century. These people are marvelous writers. I mean, one of the, to me, one of the great, greatest writers in American history is, is Franklin. His letters, his various uh, papers on subjects of all kind. And he was, a, he was a man who was very much at the forefront of the technology of his time. He was considered, he was one of the great celebrities of the late 18th century. But as a scientist, as a man who had brought lightning from the sky, but he is still a wonderful writer and, and, the, and his writing is, is uh, grounded on his observation and his understanding of other people, which helps him to understand himself, which allows him to write Poor Richard's Almanac. 
and he has a magnificent vocabulary. Again, I mean, I keep coming back to that. If, if, you, if you want to know yourself or who you are or find it, the freedom of your own mind, which in, in the end is the best and only kind of freedom, uh, you don't have the words. <laughs> it, it, it makes it harder to do. We did a we did a issue a couple of uh, last year on the means of communication, and, and one one of the people that's quoted in it is, is George Steiner, and he says the two the true catastrophe of Babel is not the scattering of tongues; it is the reduction of human speech to a handful of planetary multinational tongues. Anglo-American standardized vocabularies and grammar shaped by military technocratic, technocratic megalomania and the imperatives of commercial greed, which is the voice of money talking to money in the currency that Toni Morrison, accepting the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1993, denominates as the language that drinks blood. Happy to admire its own paralysis, possessed of no desire or purpose other than maintaining the free range of narcotic narcissism. Dumb, predatory, sentimental. Exciting reverence in school children, providing a shelter for despots. Language designed to sanction ignorance and preserve privileged. And that, of course, is the language in which, to me, is, is, is what you find, uh, or too often find, when you go to the internet, or when you read the blog, or when you read Wikipedia. It's certainly the language that, that is uh, the, the one we conduct our national elections in. I mean, <laughs> the debasement of the language shows up in, in, in what uh, in any presidential year. I mean, because the reason is because it is the uh, candidates essentially are pieces of farm equipment meant to cultivate uh, votes and, and measured only by the, uh, their ability to cultivate votes and by the cost of their manufacture. And, and they, they have developed, we have, to, and, and they, if, you, if you listen to the <coughs> presidential campaigns, I mean, they have developed the art of saying nothing, <coughs> which has increasingly become our public discourse. And technology is not an answer to that. Um, and so, again, I, I am a Luddite. On the other hand, I think that the uh, that language is is fundamental to the life of of the human being, and so I'm I'm sure we can eventually teach a language uh, to to the the internet or 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 to a computer. Uh, Certainly when the Gutenberg Press first appeared at the end of the 15th century, there was a lot of outrage from the literary crowd, people like myself, who you know, were monks or priests or classicists, humanists in Renaissance Italy, saying this is horrendous. There, there will be now nothing but vulgar, vernacular, uh, misunderstanding, ignorance, crime in, in, in the hands of the rabble. So maybe maybe I'm coming from that point of view, but on, on the the, the uh, on the other hand, uh, and and maybe it's possible. I mean, the, the printing press is invented in the late 15th century, and it's another hundred years before you get to Shakespeare, Cervantes, and Montaigne, all all of them coming up at the end of the 16th century. So maybe. Uh, it just takes time, and, and maybe for the moment, uh, we're playing with 
the technology uh, as if we're playing with very expensive toys and, and using it mostly as data mining. Uh, McLuhan said, that he talked about Madison Avenue, frogmen of the mind, um, searching for the treasure of human credulity and desire. And the, again, I mean, the, uh, the powers of, of Google and Facebook and surveillance are beyond the wildest dreams of the Spanish Inquisition or the NKVD or the Gestapo, but it was the same kind of, of data mining with the same kind of uh, purpose in mind. I mean, the purpose here, clearly, the politics of, of the next however many years are going to be, democracy clearly doesn't work in, in, at the, with the, uh, the numbers that we've got. I mean, the dysfunction in, John, in, in, in Washington, the Constitution is written in 1787, the population of the United States is 3, 000, uh, 3 million, a little more. And the vote is limited to people who essentially own property and can read and write. We now have a population of 320 million, and we have very large uh, uh, proportions of, of that population that cannot read or write. And so, again, as Darton points out, without that kind of a skill uh, or an attention span, I mean, when Lincoln is standing up to talk to Stephen Douglas in The Sun in Illinois, the famous Douglas-Lincoln debates, I mean, they talk, they talk for four hours. In the in the hot sun, men wearing uh, wool clothes. Like you can't imagine. I mean, we we, we now have reduced the uh, you know fifteen second soundbite. Uh, that's very good for for the digital world. That fits. I mean, that's like a tweet, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't teach. Um, democratic self-government. So clearly we're going to end up with something totalitarian, or whether we call it monarchy or whether we call it, I don't know, we'll, we'll come up with a good name for it, but it will essentially be uh, dictatorship with a smiling face because otherwise how are you going to control a, a population population becoming increasingly illiterate, um, of whom maybe, what, 50% vote? Even fewer know how the government works? I mean, you can now take a course at Yale University and you can go all the way through uh, uh, Yale without ever coming across such a thing as the American Constitution. You can, you can fill your 18th century history requirement with a, um, two semesters on Indian uh, blankets or women in New England or slavery in the South. I mean, you, you never have to go to Philadelphia and, and find out how the government was put together and, and why and uh, what the words mean. Maybe later you can look it up on, on Wikipedia, but <laughs> it, again, it, it, it requires, you have to pay attention. And the, um, the people who set up, de democracy requires paying attention. It's the hardest possible form of government because it, it does require paying attention, which means listening to other people and getting people uh, not to lie to you. The, um, and advertising is, is, the more than our language becomes the language of advertising, it is, is by definition a lie. <coughs> uh, James Kenamore 
Fenimore Cooper wrote a wonderful book called The American Democrat. He published it in 1837. And again, he says, um, the principal virtue of, of a democracy is candor. That is to say, each of us trying to tell each other the truth as we know it, as we as individuals know it, not as it has been presented to me in a, a, uh, by an algorithm. And, and Kevin explained to you this morning what happens when algorithms uh, are left without human supervision. 18,000 times the market crashes in the last however many years. I can't remember whether it was eight or nine. And if you want to turn over the government to, uh, or the solving of the problems of the world to a technology, uh, it would, it, the odds are not good. Thank you. I, I can just dribble, drone on for, for a long time, but I'll stop. Thank you.